welcome to my life. Uh, we're honored to have John Jones with us today uh, in our effort to feature some of our World War II veterans. Uh, John has been gracious enough to come by here to talk about his life. He's been a longtime Oxford resident since 1955. Obviously, John is a member of the V8, uh, VFW. Uh, he's a retired General Motors man, and uh, he obviously was in World War II in the Marine Corps. And John, you were even in Okinawa. Yes. That's a lot. You've got a lot of memories. Okinawa was uh, an odd place. Everybody that's there was smaller than anywhere else. The only thing I saw there of a normal size was a goat. This, their goats were the same size as ours. Everything else was small. The people were small. And the cattle were small. It just a, it's a weird place, really. I don't know if it's a land that the Lord forgot or what. But <laughs> I've never heard that before. It, it's really weird to see how many uh, people there are there. And they're very hardy people. They work hard, but they're little bitty people. They're not very big. <laughs> and one lady went out to work in the morning, very obviously pregnant as she could be. And when she came back that night, she had a baby on her back carrying it in a sling. My goodness. So they're hardy. It didn't bother her a bit. I guess so. so. Well, I, I want to cover a lot of ground with you as far as World War II goes. But, mm -hmm. but let's start by talking about you. Where were you born? I was born in a little place in the southern part of Missouri called Neelyville, just a few miles above the Arkansas border. And what did your parents do? Dad was a farmer. But when, uh, when it got so he couldn't make a living at farming because of the way that it was coming to the uh, big d recession, you know. Right. Uh, then he left there and went into Arkansas and got a job on a cotton plantation because they were still working. Ah. Now, and, did you ever try and trace your family back at all? Do you know what generation was the first to arrive in this country? I did a little of it, but not as much as what my son has done. He's done a lot of it, my, oh. my son Kevin. Well, just for example, did your grandparents, were they born here? My grandparents were born here, but, but their grandparents, I mean, their parents came from uh, England. Okay, so yeah. it was probably early 1800s that yeah. some of them uh, came some of them, were, some of them came from Ireland and some came from England. Wow. But the, and some came from Scotland, too. I've got Scottish in, in my blood. Scotch, uh, but, Irish, and English. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you said your, your dad decided to move to what state again to, to get into the cotton He farm? moved to Illinois to get a job in the coal mines. In the coal mines? Yeah, so wow. that's, uh, that's where he moved to after he left the cotton. Now, how uh, old were you when this happened? Well, now that's a funny story, too. I, uh, when we went to, to, uh, to Arkansas, we got there late, and the school had already started. It was a small school. And I was six, and I was the youngest one in the family at the time. And uh, we were able to go to school, but they wouldn't let us because the school was small and they had started it already and we were late and they didn't have room in the school. So I missed that entire year. And so when I came into uh, Illinois, uh, I was already seven years of age. I didn't start first grade until I was seven. So I got behind everybody else. You were probably the smartest kid in the class, though, because <laughs> you were a little older than them. I made good grades all the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was in Illinois. Yeah. And what was your dad doing at that point? What was your father's occupation in Illinois? Oh, he was a coal miner. Coal miner in mm -hmm. Illinois. Yeah, he got a job in the coal mines. Okay. So that's the job he held until he retired. What was your grade school like? Was it a, uh, was a, grade it a very school? big school? Well, or? they had a good grade school when I, when I started the school was in uh, Illinois. What city? Do you remember? Uh, Ziegler. Z-E-I-G-L-E-R. Ziegler. Okay. They, most of the time you see that spelled Z-I-E, but that one's Z-E-I. Z -E -I, Ziegler. Did you have a very big class? Big class? Did you have a very big class? Uh, fairly, fairly large. There were a lot, a lot of people there because a lot of coal miners come in there and work and uh -huh. had big families and so there's a lot of quite a few kids in my class. Now, you know, sometimes the coal miners they had their own communities. Did you did you live in, in the No. I know some of those communities without that and but we didn't. We had a house that dad was able to uh 
uh, rent when he first got there. Somebody that he knew before he came down that street said there's a house on that street for rent. So Dad went down there, and sure enough, we got that house. So how many years did you live there? Uh, until I went to the Marine Corps. So the rest of your schooling, uh, you lived was in, right there in Ziegler, Illinois. Right there in Ziegler, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So what did you do for a good time when you were in grade school in oh, Ziegler, Illinois, while your dad to, was in the coal mine? We loved to swim, and we loved to go into the to the big muddy river, they called it. It, it was big and muddy when it was up, but when it was down, it wasn't too, too big of a... But when it was down, it's when we go in there and, and hog the catfish out of the holes back under the bank. <laughs> and uh, Did you cook them and eat them? Oh, yeah. Now, whereabouts is Ziegler, Illinois? Is it in the southern part of the state? Uh, or It's in the southern part of the state. Uh, the nearest town of any size is Carbondale. Uh -huh. They have a university there, and you might have heard of that. But that's the nearest town of any size to, to us. But it, there's another town called West Frankfort. Some people have heard of that one. And, uh, and the county seat was Benton. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that one or not. Now, did your mother work outside of the home? No, she didn't. Okay. She just, she was a mother to the kids, and she had a bunch of them. <laughs> now, uh, did you, uh, you had brothers and sisters, didn't mm -hmm. you? How many did there you have? There was eight of us in our family. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, I had five brothers and three sisters. And you were the oldest? No, I was. You were the youngest? My, my older, the oldest in the family was my brother Clyde, and he was 10 years older than me. I see. So now he would have been, if he was alive, he'd be uh, 90, well, about like me, he's going to be 92 pretty soon. I'm 91 now. Uh -huh. So, uh, but he died as an operation, and, and they wanted to, uh, they claimed he had prostate cancer. They wanted to operate on that. And I told him, I said, Clyde, if I were you, I'd wait till I got well over this heart bypass operation before I did that. And he didn't wait. They operated him anyway, and he didn't make it. Hmm. So you went to high school in Ziegler, Illinois. Mm -hmm. What year did you graduate? Do you remember? I graduated in 1943, and, and as soon as I got ready to go, I got in the Marine Corps. <laughs> well, the war was going strong in 1943. Yes, it was. So you kind of knew that being a young man, that was what was in store for you. Oh, you yeah. were going to go and I fight in the war. To go too, to it. In fact, before I got out of school, I graduated in June, and before I got out of school, the draft board drafted me. I went over to the draft board and talked to them to let me stay there until I graduated, and they said, okay, we'll agree to that. So I got out of there, and instead of going back to the draft board, I went to the Marine Corps, <laughs> and I asked that sergeant, I said, hey, uh, could I get the Marine Corps instead of getting drafted? And he said, hey, whoever gets a hold of you first has got you, so you don't have to worry about that. So, so I got in the Marine Corps. Why did you want to go into the Marine Corps? Well, my older brother was in there for one oh. thing. Oh. And he was a sergeant stationed out at the East Coast, so I think, I think he was at Quantico then. And so I just got in there because of him, I guess, more than anything else. And uh, come to find out, my kid brother followed me in. We there were three of us. In there. <laughs> oh my! Listen, I want to talk more about that in a moment, but we have to take a little break. We'll be right back. Uh, okay. You're watching OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford, Addison Township, and the Village of Leonard. We're here with Oxford resident John Jones talking about his experiences during World War II. And we're just getting started with that, John. You were talking about uh, joining the Marine Corps and why you did. You had a brother who was in it, yes. right? Yes, I did. In fact, did you have more than one brother who was in? Well, my kid brother came along and followed us. He came in there, too, so he was a Marine. Really? Three of us boys. And, uh, and he is, my older brother now uh, died. Uh, two, three years ago. I can't remember. He was, he would have been 92 if he'd have lived another couple of months. Yeah. So he was pretty old, but, and he died, and then my kid brother, though, that joined in after me, he's, he's so close to my age that we're, we're great friends. He lives over there close to Waterford. Oh, so he's still in town? Oh, he's yes. in town. He lives by Waterford, and, and, uh, 
Uh, we get together quite often. In other words, we're, we're great friends and great buddies and good brothers too. <laughs> I have to ask you now, you, your, your first wife's name was May. She passed away a few mm -hmm. years ago. At what point in all this did you meet her? Did you know her in high school or? Uh, no, I didn't know her in high school, but it's kind of hard to look back and see exactly what did you I, did you meet her while you were in the service or no, right afterwards? After I got home from after you came yeah. home. All right. Let's for now, let's go back and talk about what you did in the service. You joined the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Where was the first place they sent you? Well, we w we went to Pearl Harbor first, but it was uh, But for training, where did you go? Oh, we well, the training I went to the East Coast at uh, Cherry Point North Carolina Air Base. Okay. But I, but I went through boot camp at San Diego. San Diego? And it's called boot camp because after all we are part of the Navy. Right. Marines and Navy. And uh, so they had their boot camp there and that's where I went through boot camp. And then from there I had had some aircraft mechanics in, in high school and I liked what I was doing there and so they asked us if we had a preference of what we wanted to do. And I told him, I said, I had some aircraft mechanic classes in high school, and, and I'd kind of like to go on an air wing. And they said, okay. So they put me in the air wing, and I became an aircraft mechanic. And so that's what I did. I didn't get out there and, and, and fight too much with a gun like most of the guys. Oh, we had, we had to do that sometime, but not as a rule. You're on that, you're, you're, your main thing is to keep that aircraft going. That was an important job. Mm -hmm. Where did you go for training in that? Uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Oklahoma? Mm hmm They had uh, a, a rather big base there then, but now, the last time I was in Norman, they, was, they didn't even have anything. They wiped it right off and no base at all there now. A lot has changed in all this time, time, hasn't it? So, right after Norman, Oklahoma, where did they send you as an aircraft mechanic? Where was your first assignment? It was at uh, Cherry Point, North Carolina. Okay. Did they send you overseas shortly thereafter? You no, know, I stayed there quite a while. Uh, took the training that I needed to do as far as uh, being able to act as a mechanic that was in charge of the ship that you're assigned to. I had two guys under me, and we worked uh, had mechanics there for a while, but when we did leave to go overseas, why well, it was from there we started. We went to the West Coast and went overseas from the West Coast, but uh -huh. we left Cherry Point by railroad and, and uh, went overseas from the West. From the now, were you on an aircraft carrier? Mm -mm. No. Okay. No, we our planes was on the aircraft carrier a few times when we'd move, but then we we go in with a line company. Because we we've been trained like all the other Marines, so we go in with them, and uh, then after we got our place secured, why well, the planes would come in off the carrier, but we never was on the carrier. But uh, well, that's that surprised me about going into uh, uh, when we when we went into. I believe that was Okinawa. We went in there and we, and we got a surprise of our life because they usually try to get you at, when you're getting off the off the boat and getting the landing craft and as soon as you get to shore they try to get you then. But that one spot we did we were a mile inland before we met any re, any resistance at all. Really, that was surprising. But we met the resistance about a mile inland and then from there on it was. Uh, trying to get our way through and until we contacted, uh, you know, got with a bunch of CBs that could lay down a landing strip for us because that, that field that the Japs were using was full of mud. I don't know how they, I don't know how they ever flown off of there. But was Okinawa the first place that you went to overseas or not? Oh no, I was in the Marshall Islands. In the Marshall Islands. Marshall Islands. Tell Everyone. us about that. What was that like? Well, it was about eight miles, or I mean, uh, yeah, just about eight miles north of the equator. Mm -hmm. And it got so hot you could fry an egg on a 
barrel, if <laughs> you help into the barrel, you drop an egg on it, it would fry right like that. So it was uh, pretty hot, and we stayed there for a while, and we had what we call Roy Namur. It was two islands. Roy, we stayed on one island. They had a causeway built for us by the Seabees, and our aircraft was on the other island. So Roy Namur made made up. So we had the aircraft on on uh, Namur, and we were on Roy. It's spelled O R I O. R, R O I. Right. And uh, so we'd go 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 over there daily to take care of the planes. Three shifts. There's somebody always over there taking care of those planes so that they got off and back on and got repaired and all that stuff. So uh, we take there's three hour. I mean three shifts a day, and somebody was always over there with the planes. And uh, I remember one day we got a court torn. Uh, Oh, got some orders. Uh, got it some washed the causeway out. I can't think of what you call it. Uh, the, That's okay. Just keep going. And, and it washed the car causeway out. And nobody could get over there, so the guys was over there had to stay. And about three days before the CBs got the new causeway put in, and uh, so that was kind of rough. But what was going hmm. through your mind as a young man during that time? Uh in the middle of a war. Right in the middle of everything. It, it, it didn't really, I never really got to the point where I worried too much about the war because I knew what my job was and I, and I was good at it. And so uh, we just did what we were supposed to do and we never worried about anything. I, at that time, I wasn't uh, even thinking about it. Maybe I'd get killed, never thought of it. It just didn't, didn't cross my mind that I would get killed. Well, so. you know, a lot of people say that when they're in the middle of a war like that, the thing that goes through their minds all the time is looking out for their buddies. Yeah. And in your case, looking out for their buddies was keeping those airplanes up and yeah. running. I said that to a pilot one day uh, that I ran into. Well, in fact, after I came home, and he's a doctor now, but he uh, w went... He, he told me, he saw my ring and he said, you were a Marine? I said, yes. He said, me too. I was at Cherry Point. And I said, I was there. But I said, I'm just a lowly mechanic. He said, hey, don't say that. It's, it's you guys that we depended on to keep those planes going. So you can't say you're a lowly mechanic. Was he a pilot? <laughs> yeah, he was a pilot. What kind of aircraft were you working on then? Well, the F-4U was that gold-shaped wing plane. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a real good plane. In fact, I think it was one of the better ones. I worked on F6s and uh, had a had a few uh, lightning peach 38s with a double tail right and uh, but the F4Us I think is the best plane we had we got the gull shaped wings and boy they could carry a 500 pound bomb and and all kinds of stuff and uh, it, and they had a, a 6 50 caliber machine guns and when they cut loose with those, it's pretty good, too. <laughs> we got to take a little break, but uh, okay. we'll be right back. Please rejoin us. All right. Hi, everyone. Don't forget you can purchase DVDs of your favorite shows from OCTV, whether it's Minutes by Minute, Our Community Access, or Connie's Kitchen. Just call the station. Our number is 248-628-9658. Enjoy watching all of our shows on OCTV. Back with John Jones talking about his experiences during the war, World War II to be exact. John, tell me, were you what island were you on again? What you were just talking about? What was the island you were on? You were just talking about Roy Namor. Roy Namor. Okay. Yeah. And you told us what kind of airplanes you were working on. That was the, the F4Us. Right. And uh, they were built by Vought Sikorsky. Mm -hmm. If you ever heard of that yes. craft name. And they could carry 500 pound bombs or whatever they had to carry. Uh, they also carried napalm bombs, which is a, a big tank filled full of some kind of a jellied material that, that when it uh, hit the ground, it exploded. And this napalm, whatever it touched, it burned. I mean, right. it burned down the, the forest or whatever it hit on. Right. And they so, even used that in Vietnam, I believe, didn't they? I think they did. Yeah. Tell me, were you worried at all there 
about being attacked by the Japanese? Were you concerned about being attacked by them right there? No. They, uh, they come in and tried it a few times, but it didn't, they didn't do any good. And uh, they, we finally had them bottled up on a particular island down there, and I forgot the name of it. Woji, I believe, was the name of it. And uh, so we destroyed everything that they had. That they, could, they couldn't get off the island. So right. they were bottled up down there. And so all they did was occasionally go down there and drop a bomb or two. But those Japs were still on there, and they'd always fire at you. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't in a, in a plane, but the pilots had come back, and, and one pilot did come back with the, the one bullet went through his cockpit and hit him in the side of the eye right here and, and knocked that bone out, and his eye fell down on a string. And uh, he radioed his buddies and told them that he was hit, and he said, I think it... You talk to me to keep me awake, I said, I think I could get back. And so they kept encouraging him and telling him and come on and talking to him and everything. And he came in and landed that plane, brought it to a halt and turned it off. And when we got up there on the wing to help him out, he was dead to the world. Oh he, I mean, not died, he didn't die, but he was passed out. Passed out. But he hung on long enough to, to land that plane. And uh, his eye was hanging out down there. The, the uh, medic just stuffed his eye back in the socket best he could and taped it so it would stay there. And then about 15 minutes later, he was on his way back to Guam because they had a hospital back there. So, so now, did you go to Okinawa after that, right after that? I went to Okinawa after we left the Marshall Islands, yes. We went down to, we stopped at Saipan and Tinny and a couple of other islands, but that was just to more or less stay over long enough to pick up somebody or let somebody off. And we ended up on Okinawa. And that's the place that I thought was so weird because everything yeah. was small there. What was your base like in Okinawa? Was it a huge base? Was it small? Well, was it? Yeah, we had a nice base in the northern, on, on the Yontan field after we got the CBs and they laid down landing strips and made it so we could land our planes. And they came in off the carrier and landed. And uh, they had to put down a strip because that place was so muddy. I don't know how the Japanese used it. <laughs> so the CBs did a good job putting down those landing strips. You know, you know those long metal things about so wide with holes in them. Mm -hmm. They put those down and thick enough and heavy enough that they could, you could land a plane on them. So it worked out pretty good. Now you, I would imagine, you had a little more contact with the enemy there than you did before. Yeah, but we got raided a lot there. And uh, they came over. In fact, one night, a, a friend of mine, we called him Giggy. <laughs> I don't know why we called him that. His name was Johnson. But anyway, we all dug foxholes and got down in those foxholes. If you was below the ground, the only thing that's going to get you would be a direct hit. You might hurt your ears and everything, but you're supposed to hold your mouth open when you hear the bombs dropping because it'll kind of equalize the pressure. And so we hold our mouths open and everything, but you get those foxholes deep enough to, so that you could get below the surface of the ground, you was all right. And one night it rained real good, and we got a, I got a hole full of water, but I was in there anyway. And uh, this Giggy Johnson I was telling you about, he, he, didn't, he didn't even bother to get out of the tent. He said, they'll never hit this tent. He just stayed in the tent. But that night they got so close that he got scared. <laughs> and he, he ran down there and jumped in that hole, landed on my shoulder and pushed me down in the water. <laughs> I said, you stupid guy, won't you dig your own hole? <laughs> but anyway, there's a lot of funny things happened too. But so how long were you in Okinawa altogether? Gee, we were there a long time. Were you there till the end of the war? Yeah. When the war ended, uh, well, back in the States, I'd run into Tyrone Power. Did you ever hear of him? I certainly have, the actor. And he was, he was a pilot, but he was too old to be a fighter pilot, so he was a pilot on a transport plane. And I ran into him at Cherry Point and got to talk with him and everything. I thought he's a decent guy. He, he, felt, he was okay. And so then he was one of the pilots that flew us when we left there and went to Japan. So we went up to Occupy Japan. He was one of the pilots that flew us up there. You were, you were flown by a movie star. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, so we got up there, and, and uh, 
That's where it was when they, when they dropped the atomic bombs on these two places. In Oklahoma. Nagasaki and the other one. Yeah. And uh, I never did go down and walk around in it or anything, but I got to see it from a distance. And they say, well, the, the, the fallout from that stuff is deadly. You shouldn't be walking out there. So we didn't. Right. But it was, we could see it really messed up. Uh, Yokohama was obliterated practically and half of Tokyo was was gone too because of Doolittle making his raids on it mm -hmm. before we did and so he did a good job on that town. He, he was about a fourth of it gone before we got there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your uniform that you were gracious enough to wear for us today. Can you tell us what some of those medals, or not medals, but what these awards are for over uh, here? The, each, each, uh, each star stands for the, the number of battles that you was in. Really? And uh, they have a, uh, that, that is a, a ribbon right there that nearly everybody gets, whether you just being in a service, you right. get that ribbon. And, and this is a, um, a unit, a naval unit, unitation, a, na a naval unit citation. citation, and there's two battle stars on that, and this one here was a it wasn't a, it wasn't a naval unit citation. It's a, well, that's okay. You've got some nice that. awards there. I can't remember that, but there was one battle star for that, but it was the, the unit citation. Is a the unit that we got in got mm -hmm. the citation and you got the battle stars. All right. So, and this one here had one in it, but it's gone. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't do anything too great in the no. war. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. All right. So you came back. How did you come to Michigan? What brought you to Michigan? Well, more than anything else, I was I, was, I didn't want to go in the coal mines, and that's what my dad worked in. And he got covered up once, and he, he was in the hospital for five months. He still lived to be over 92 years of really? age. Really? But he was in the hospital for five months, and we thought we were going to lose him. He had some, some uh, machine under there they call a joy machine. I don't know why they call it that. It was no joy. But it cut back under the face of the coal. And then at night, shot flyers, fires would come in and drill holes in the coal. And then they'd get off on the, down the entryway and, and set it off, and it'd, it'd knock the coal down. The next day, somebody would have to move it, move it out. And one of these joy machines that they was operating, they said it was a joy machine. They was gathering up that coal and moving it out so they could lower, put it into little railroad cars, underground railroad, and haul it to the, to the, to the shaft where they could be taken to the surface. And this joy machine knocked the prop out where my dad was standing and the roof fell on him and uh, so they had to have props to hold up the roof. And how was, old was he at that time roughly? Well, 40s, 50s? Yeah he was probably close to 50 and, and, that, and he was in the hospital for five months but he pulled through wow. and lived to be 92 years old. Did pretty good. Well, we're really pleased to have you with us. We're out of time for this segment of my life, but I want to talk to you some more. I hope you're willing to stick around because I'd like to have a part two. Okay. Because there's a lot more of the ground that I think we need to cover. Okay. So thank you so much for being with us, John. It's okay. an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for your service. See, and like being back there now, looking back there, the distance is pretty clear. I mean, I can talk about what happened years ago or way back there, but it's, it's stuff up close that I have this. That's fine. Memory. That's just so. fine. We'll see you next time.